So we've got those ready to go. Uh, now it's time to move on to D5 and start assembling all this stuff. Um, we've got these two little Phillips, I mean, excuse me, um, countersink screws here. And they are very small. These are very delicate. If you over tighten these, you will break them. So be very sparing on the Loctite. These just orient these parts during assembly so that you don't have to try to juggle them or work with five hands, which you don't have. If you didn't have those little screws, it, it would be very hard to do the assembly. I'll just move a few things around here. Okay, so... First, we need our Ford bracket, which is going to go right here. And as you can see, trying to hold that there while you're trying to get screws in from below and arms with pins and everything, and then another one of these at the rear, it would be a real juggling act. Whereas these little screws will go in the center from below and they will hold these pieces in place for us. And again, be extremely sparing on the Loctite. These are super small. Thank God I've got something. Um, this is a 0.05 uh, millimeter. And that's kind of a rare one. You may need to go looking for one of these if you don't own one. And the reason you want to be so sparing on the Loctite is that you don't want to make these impossible to get back out again where you break the screw because you'll ruin the part. Now, I want to test. Now, here are our pins. Um, there's two different types. The thicker ones that do not have a threaded end, those are threaded ends, plural. Those are the ones that we use for the innermost. And I just wanted to make sure that, yep, I do not need to use a reamer. That's one of the nice things about TLR kits, these stiffsels. They really do a great job of molding them. Now, do we need spacers? It does not look like we need any spacers. And let's make sure we've got our, that's our right. And the... Uh, nomenclature faces rearward. So, you know, orientation is very important. You'll save yourself a lot of time not having to put these things back together, take it apart, and then redo. Now, the reason, of course, I did not put the uh, this piece on here and lock it down with the retaining screw is because you, you have to do one and then the other. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get your pins in place. Okay, this piece is going to go on here and, excuse me, upside down like so. It's our little rear bumper piece. And as you can see, the, uh, the amount of uh, angle on these, that's our toe. Hmm. 
That's odd. Okay, there's a little bit of Ford and back here. And I'm surprised that they don't give us some kind of spacer there. Um, I'm going to try these little plastic washers that I had left over from earlier and see if that will keep that from moving around without any binding. And I'll put them at the front, not the rear, if they fit. Okay, that does not fit. It's stiff. So I guess we're just going to go with them being a little loose. I could try finding some shims that were smaller, but I'm just going to trust that they have a reason for doing it the way they did. Just checking that I didn't flip something around when I was disassembling and reassembling. Okay, now we can... We're going to put the transmission in. And they've got some little uh, attention getters here about which screws we need to use. And okay, so we need two tens and two twelves for not for these, but for the underside, the rear mounts. And the tens go at the far back, and the um, twelves go on the Ford two holes on when we're talking about in relationship to the differential. Now the issue is that these, if they are in the wrong area, they can deform the case for the transmission and actually impact the, um, the gear on our differential. So make sure to check that everything spins smoothly as you go. Not tightening down all the way just yet.
Okay, no issues there. We need a pair of eights for our waterfall. And yes, I'm using titanium for this because I have them. Just a little theory, uh, throw this out. Um, I've always been a fan of mid-engine cars versus front or rear. Um, I've actually owned uh, one of the early generation MR2s. I used to autocross it, and I just love that center weight balance that you only get with mid-engine cars. Now, radio control cars, since their inception, have been... Uh, not all of them, but the early ones were very focused on rear engine. And usually the rear engine, the engine being behind the axle hanging off the back. There's very good reason for this. The first radio control cars and specifically the first race bred car, the original RC10 Gold Pan, which I actually had one when they came out. I was on that waiting list and uh, built one right away, loved it. Very difficult to get that transmission right. Anyway, um, they were modeled out after the desert racing Baja buggies and Baja rail cars that were raced in California and uh, Mexico. And they were built out of Volkswagen bugs the even the rail cars the buggies were built <clears throat> using that rear transmission rear four cylinder air cooled engine because <clears throat> they were reliable and it was independent suspension and uh it was very practical the car had a, a flat pan bottom and uh so it could slide over things easy and it made for a great off-road uh setup but radio control cars are not full-size vehicles and the weights being different and things like that over the years more and more the two-wheel drive cars stayed with that rear motor configuration then they started swinging it forward into a high configuration but that raises your center of gravity um finally uh when was it i think it was Oh, it's got to have been like almost 20 years now. They TLR brought out, uh, I think it was their two-wheel drive short course truck with the two transmissions. You could run the transmission with the rear motor or you could run it in a mid-motor configuration. And everyone was saying, ah, oh, don't do the mid-motors, you know, go with the, you know, go with what works. And I was like, hey, you know, this thing is going to be a wheelie machine having that weight center makes for better cornering you don't have that engine back there making the car want to be a pendulum and whip around uh and now almost all of them have the motors up front battery in the middle servo in the middle you know all the weight between the axles and low which is as it should be <laughs> in my opinion my opinion you don't have to agree but that's how I like it. So now we have these two rear holes here. And as you can see, remember I was talking about this being a little off. There's a little bit of a gap there. These holes aren't quite centered. They're a little uh, off in the rearward direction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find out what screw size these need to be. I'm going to loosen this screw and get those in and let's see those are 
Uh, five, nine, six, threes, which is another set of, set of twelves. Okay, that sounds kind of odd because we got tens here. And they want us to put twelves behind them, but nope, that's that's the way it is. this up. Okay, also I'm going to loosen the four transmission screws to make sure these go in because they don't seem to want to. In fact, here, let me just show you. You can see how the holes aren't quite lining up. This is a little rearward, and that's accounting for this bit of jiggle here. I'm going to, now that this is in, in place here in between the trans and can't just fall out, I'm going to remove that screw altogether to make sure I can get these to line up um, if, in case this is holding it back because that might be something that I just leave in place during installation and then remove afterwards. I don't know, but I can always try to, I'll try to put it back in after I get these lined up. There we go, and see if I push on it, I can get at least one of them properly lined up. The other one, there we go. Just give that a couple twists. And see, now that arm doesn't jiggle quite as much. There we go. Now let's see if this screw goes back in. Yes, it does. Perfect. So much less jiggle. There we go. Okay. Okay, so uh, we got our transmission on. Uh, our next step is uh, D7. Uh, shock towers, easy enough, and um, uh, the build that I am following, they uh, say just like the front, uh, two and middle, um, which is the middle uh, hole on the shock arm, and uh, the number two there, which is the middle hole on the shock tower. Nice and easy. Um, now the question is shocks in front or shocks behind. Uh, you'll notice that your arms have uh, shock mounting holes on either side of the arm and that allows you to mount your shock absorbers either in front or behind. And uh, that is um, something I need to check here on my sheet. Let's see, how do they have it for us? Okay, um, on the stock build, it looks like the shocks are in front. I'll just 
confirm that. Okay, shock mounting rear. Now, to mount the shocks in the rear, that means this has to face the opposite direction. Like that. Which means that the mounts need to come through on that side. Now, one thing I'm not going to be able to completely emulate is the springs for this build because uh, Dakota Fend is using Kyosho springs. That is one thing you will see a lot is that um, not that pro drivers are necessarily using Kyosho specifically, but that um, people will use springs from different manufacturers uh, that are the same diameter uh, because they're looking for a specific spring rate or a specific result out of a shock absorber. Uh, for example, the um, uh, turn the clock back, say, 10 years ago, uh, and for quite a while thereafter, the, um, the Losi rear yellow buggy spring not the short course spring or the truck spring the buggy spring specifically was extremely popular in a lot of applications whether it was for an so you'd see an associated with the tlr yellow spring uh buggy specific spring and it's because you know it's sometimes it's not just the spring rate it's the length of the spring um and uh it you know things just have their own way of you know being uh unique i guess uh just you know there's no other spring was quite like it and made those cars perform as well and so you'd see all these uh cars using that same rear spring Okay, so we need 10 millimeters, four of them. Now, these are going into metal inserts. It's kind of interesting that this is the only place on the transmission that they use inserts. In fact, it's the only part uh, that TLR has for this vehicle that has a, uh, a threaded metal insert molded into the plastic. So these we will need a little bit of Loctite on. Not a lot, um, because this isn't something that's going to come loose easy. But it does make changing this piece a lot easier. So if you're going to pull the transmission or if you're you know if you got to split it you got to take this off if you want to switch shock locations any of those things you're going to be taking this off and having it be um you know metal on metal it uh does tend to uh be easier to remove to get the screws out now I'm not using a power driver anywhere in this build, but that's because I'm doing a fresh build. If I were uh, at the track and I were disassembling uh, major parts of this car uh, to make changes or whatnot, repairs, I would definitely be disassembling using an electric screwdriver because you can't do any damage when you're removing screws that way. 
And if you do your torque setting low enough, you can put stuff in with an electric screwdriver without doing any damage either. Um, I have a little Ryobi screwdriver that I've had for years that has a very nice uh, clutch on the front of it that you can adjust for torque. And um, I usually put it on almost its lowest setting as long as it'll still drive the, uh, drive the, the screw in. And then when it gets down to, you know, being almost tight, I do finishing by hand. Okay, so now it's time to uh, mount our, uh, this is for our camberlink arms. Um, this is a piece that has multiple possible locations. And the way that is determined is by a little plastic plate. Sorry about bumping the camera there. This piece right here. And as you can see, it says one millimeter and it has an arrow that can either face up or face down. And depending on its whether you have it facing up or down, it's going to uh, raise or lower this mounting point. Let me uh, see where this is recommended for. Um, let's see. Okay, there's uh, down one millimeter, up one millimeter, or zero. Now, they didn't give us the plate for zero. Did they give us a... Yeah, we have a... Uh, one of the pieces that was in the tuning kit earlier is our zero item. Let me just see where this is in my build. For you, if you're building stock build, it's recommended as uh, down one millimeter or negative one millimeter. And the inner link spacer is minus one millimeter. So factory setting. So that's going to be pointing downward like that. And we need a pair of 12s. Another reason that I'm going ahead and doing the titanium everywhere I can is because ultimately, uh, eventually I, I plan to shed all this extra brass weight that I've put on here. And... Uh, you know, when I'm fully familiar with the car, I'll be wanting to make it as light as possible to get the most speed out of it. Uh, but for the time being, I want it to be heavy and docile and easier to drive. Now, sometimes a good thing to do is almost to pre-tap these. Um, some holes are just hard to get to. And some kits I do this, like when I was building my 1 8 buggy, I did this a lot, um, was to use a power driver and screw partway in on all the holes. If the hole went all the way through, I would go ahead and run a screw all the way through and then back out again. And by pre-threading the hole, it makes it easier to, uh, to get them to put things together. You have to be careful with that, though, because um, when you're using a power driver, the screw can get very hot. And you can potentially do damage to the plastic that way. So now that I've 
pre-threaded those holes part way, it'll be a lot easier to go ahead and get this started. So downward. So I'll check something here. Okay, now look at this. There is very little room here. And that's one of the reasons I think that this tower was set up with the metal inserts. Because to make changes to this camber link here, if you want to put a different spacer in or you want to move the ball stud to a different hole, you need this out of the way. So before I put this on, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and it even shows that order here in the directions that I was not looking at while I was busy talking, uh, is that you should be putting on the ball stud first. Let me see if there's any spacers needed. Okay. Now, also, because you have the um, the inner link spacer option here, which is this right here, by moving it down, up one, and up two, you've got the ability to change that camber link position by two millimeters. So you're either a millimeter low center or a millimeter high um, instead of putting spacers beneath the ball studs on this item it's better to make adjustments by moving this up and down using the plastic components unless you need to move it so far up that you need additional spacers then you would go ahead and do that but otherwise um, instead of taking these off and putting on spacers you just move this up and down by changing the plate. And that's kind of a nice little feature. Now, you can always make the changes outboard, you know, here. And uh, that's going to give you the, the opposite. It's going to give you the same effect, though. So these definitely need some Loctite. And remember... Um, because we're running a lay down transmission, we need to use the Ford hole number two here. That's the middle of the three. Because even though there's four holes, you really only have three positions because you're using either one, two, three, or one, two, three. I hope that makes sense. But since this is rarely going to get moved, if ever, I'm going to go ahead and use a little extra Loctite. Because I want to make sure this stays. And I may be replacing this with titanium anyway at some point soon. So... Okay, that's done. So now it's time to make ourselves a couple of linkages. Mm -hmm. 